Well, during the month of May, we have been in a series of messages entitled Money Matters. Money Matters. And we've learned a lot over the last uh, few weeks about the importance of money, uh, not just to us, but to the Lord. I think lots of Christians are fascinated uh, to find out that money matters not only to us, but to God. And uh, in fact, most Christians don't know this because the pastors don't tell them. But Jesus had more to say about money, more to say about finances and stewarding those than any other one subject. So we probably ought to be spending a lot more time teaching on it. Amen. If Jesus did, I, I probably should. And uh, so other churches uh, and ministries should as well. And I, again, just real quick in review, if you've got your message insert, uh, I love what King Solomon said. The richest man to have ever lived said this about money in Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 19, he said, money answers all things. Money answers all things. And so uh, one of the reasons why money answers all things is because it's the currency of exchange, right? We've learned about that over the last few weeks. The Reverend Billy Graham said this, if a person gets their attitude toward money straight, it will straighten out almost every other area in their lives. And that's what we've been trying to do, amen? Over the last few weeks in this month of May, We've been trying to discover what does the Word say about money and about finances and how can we get our attitude, our mindset, our worldview in line with the Word of God, right? And uh, that's something we want to do in every area of our lives, including, including biblical finances. In other words, when, when our lives are out of order with the Word of God and out of order with the will of God, here's what, here's what happens our lives will be out of order. In other words, um, when things are out of order, you know, you, you go to, uh, I don't know, uh, a particular ball game or something like that, or, or, or maybe a, a venue, and they've got vending machines. You ever see vending machines or Coke machines, products, you know? And every once in a while, there'll be a sign on the face of that vending machine. It simply says three words, out of order. What does that mean? It means it's not working. And I know a lot of people, you know a lot of people, that, uh, that, that have lives that aren't working. Come on, I'm preaching good already, all right? I, I, lives, I, this isn't in the notes. This is the spirit right here. Uh, uh, when, when life isn't working, there's, there's one reason why it's not working. It's because it's out of order. Out of order with what? Out of order with the Word of God. So when life works, when life gets in order with the Word, life becomes what? Powerful, effective, and, and, it, and it works. In other words, if you get your marriage in line with the Word of God, your marriage will work. If you get your children in line with the Word of God, the children will work. Matter of fact, Proverbs says this, train up a child in the way they should go, and when he's older, what? He won't depart from it. It doesn't mean they're not going to go crazy every once in a while. <laughs> it doesn't mean that your children aren't going to make all the right decisions. That's not what it's saying. It's saying, hey, listen, if you'll train them up, if you'll, if you'll raise your children in line with the Word of God, guess what? They'll come back to it. Amen? Some of us are old enough to know, and we've got old enough children to know. That's true. That works. Why? Because the Word works. Now, when, when we get our lives in line with the Word uh, in regards to our finances, what will work? Our finances will work. And I don't know about you. I want my money to work. I want, I want my, my finances to be blessed. And guess what? God wants your money to be blessed. Matter of fact, God says, uh, I want you to prosper. Look at this with me. Jeremiah 29, verse 11 says this. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. That word plans also means desire or will. How many of you ever prayed, Lord, uh, if thy will be done, right? Well, we don't need to. We don't have to pray that if prayer. We know what the word is. We know what the will of God is. Here it is. He says, I know the plans I have for you. Here's my will for you. Plans to prosper you. Boy, that kind of settles it right there, doesn't it? <laughs> In other words, poverty is not of the Lord. Matter of fact, do you want to know what the Word of God has to say about poverty? It's a curse. It's a curse. It's, it's not just bad. It's really bad. I mean, if you've ever been broke, if you've ever had debts more than your income, you know it's, it's bad, right? When collectors start calling you, that's not good. Right? Uh, when, when things start come, coming after you, that's not good. It's a curse. So poverty is not of the Lord. What is of the Lord? Prosperity. Prosperity. God wants us to prosper 
and, and, and he says, and I have a plan to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. The psalmist said in Psalm 35, 27, May the Lord be praised and exalted, who takes great delight in the pleasure and prosperity of his servants. Here's a, a phrase, here's five words that will, uh, you know, just kind of amaze you, but here it is, it's up on the screen. God delights in our prosperity. God delights, God, God is pleased when we prosper. God is pleased when we're, in other words, God's happy when we're happy. I know that kind of seems shallow, but it's true. I mean, come on now. For those of you that have children, if you're a parent, how many of you would rather have happy children than, than, than sad children? How many of you would ever have, would like to have healthy children rather than sick children? Right? I mean, this is, this is the Word of God, right? How many of you want your children blessed and prosperous? Right? Amen. Well, that's what the will of God is. God delights in our prosperity. So, um, Jesus said it's the thief that's come to what? Steal, kill, and destroy. And poverty... Uh, destroys people. Poverty destroys lives. Uh, it destroys families. Uh, so so we, went, we want to get our lives in line with the Word of God. Well, if God wants us to prosper, which He does, what's the purpose of prosperity? Is it just to build bigger barns? Is it just to do, you know, accumulate and build a kingdom unto ourselves? Absolutely not. The true purpose, and maybe I could say it this way, the higher purpose of prosperity is not just so that we can have our needs met and then some. And God has nothing wrong with that, as we'll see here today, all right? But the true purpose of prosperity is to finance the gospel. Amen? It's all about souls. It's all about redeeming mankind from spending eternity in a devil's hell. That's really what it is, because really it's not, you know, let's just put it in perspective. A hundred years from now, a thousand years from now, a million years from now, a billion years from now, you're going to be alive. I'm going to be alive. And it's not going to matter what color of coat Pastor Tim wore to church today. It doesn't matter whether you drive a Ford or a Chevy. <laughs> Are you with me? Whether you live in a bi-level or a ranch. Whether you're a Cub fan or... Okay, maybe it does matter. Maybe no, I'm just, I'm just kidding. All right. <laughs> Whether you're a Cub fan or a Carl, it doesn't go matter 100 years from now. Are you with me? Most of the stuff we're worried about and most of the stuff we're all in, in, a, in a bind about, in, in the eternal perspective, it isn't going to matter. It just isn't. What is going to matter is this, is how many people did we, through our finances, fund the gospel so they could go to heaven with us? Uh, and that's what the, the true purpose of prosperity is. Look at just the last sentence in Deuteronomy 8. This is, again, just in review. God gives you the power and ability to produce wealth, to confirm and establish what? His covenant. What is His covenant? His, his salvation gospel. His word, His way in the earth. That's, what it, that's why we say around here it takes money to do ministry, and it takes what? It takes more money to do more ministry. We have a great vision here at the tab. We do. It's grander, way more grander than this. Just over on the, again, I keep saying this, but i got to keep casting vision for phase two on the other side of that wall, right? We can sit about 55 people in here. 300 people can fit over there. 300. Wow. That's, 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 just, that's just phase two. We're not even talking about phase three, phase four, and phase ten. <laughs> you know what I'm talking you know, Right? God's got a vision. Well, what's the difference between this phase and that phase? I hate to say it, but it's just money. That's all it is. It just take, it costs money to renovate. And so it takes money to do ministry, more money to do more ministry. We want to do media ministry. We've got, we've got television camera going right now on YouTube. We have our own YouTube channel, Facebook. But we want to go on, on local TV, national TV. What? To reach masses. Why? To, to establish the covenant. To establish the covenant so that people can receive Jesus Christ. So 100 years from now, 1,000 years from now, a million years from now, a billion years from now, they're with us in heaven. Amen. That's the, that's the purpose of, uh, of prosperity. So, so if that's God's will, then how do we do that, all right? So we're getting extremely practical, right? So we know God wants us blessed. We know the purpose for prosperity and for the blessing, but how, right? It's one thing to say, you know, here's what I want you to do. Well, how do I do that? So there's three ways we've been looking at, just real quick in review. The first way that the Word of God teaches us to prosper to begin prospering financially is through giving what the Bible calls first fruits. 
First fruits is what? It's just the first portion of the harvest, the first increase that God gives you in life. You just return it to Him as, a, as an expression of thanksgiving that He's what? He's the Lord of the harvest. Everything we have and everything we're going to have comes from Him. And we're just, all it is, it's just a little first portion. It's, it's just the first part that we give to God. The second way, again, I'm, there's teachings on this online in depth. I'm just going to highlight them in review. The second way we prosper financially is through what the Bible calls giving the tithe. The tithe means what? 10%. And we discovered God invites us to return the tithe, to return 10% of our annual income to the Lord. So if you make $60,000 this year, then a tithe of that 10% would be 6,000. 6,000 that you would give to the local church. That's the tithe, all right? And as we give to God the tithe, along with our first fruit offering, then what? Then that positions us to be blessed financially. And we're going to hear some testimonies uh, over the next couple of weeks about how people uh, began working these principles and ways and how God blessed them. I'm excited about what's coming. Way number three we began looking at last week, and I want to kind of finish up with part two of this message, is through offerings, all right? First way, first fruits. Second way is through giving our tithe. The third way is through giving an offering. An offering is any financial gift above the tithe. In other words, offerings begin at the 11% level and up. But again, just real quick in review, God doesn't care about how much you give or don't give. It's all about the percentages. All right? He's just, in other words, whether you make $100 a year or $100,000 a year, you got to return the tithe, right? And anything above the tithe is an offering. And offerings, as we discovered last week, are free will. It's what the Bible calls in the Old Testament free will offerings. In other words, um, it's up to you whether you want to give an offering or not. Uh, now, it's not up to you whether you tithe. Uh, if we don't tithe, God calls us a thief and a robber. We looked at that in Malachi 3. Uh, but free will offerings are up to us. And that's what's so exciting about them. Now, Oftentimes, offerings in the Word of God uh, speak to a principle or a law called the principle of sowing and reaping, all right? So this, uh, this principle or law is uh, throughout, throughout God's Word, all right? And I'm just going to put some, uh, some, some words up here. The principle of sowing and, uh, and reaping. Uh, today, we would, probably, we would probably call it the principle of, let me move this out here just a little bit so you can see a little bit better. There we go. How about that? Is that good? All right. Uh, we would probably call the principle of sowing and reaping today, if, if Jesus was alive, the principle of investments and returns. All right? So, uh, so as we invest, we'll then what? Then we'll reap a return. All right? Uh, I love what Galatians 6 verse 7 says. It says this simply. Do not be deceived. In other words, this is, can I put it in my own, own language? This is what God's saying. Uh, don't be fooled. Don't be, don't be fooled. Uh, I, I'm not mocked. In other words, what I say is what's going to happen. Whatever a man sows, that's what he what? That's what he reaps. Whatever we do, whatever will come back to us. And this principle of sowing and reaping, this principle of investment and return, is a, is a life principle. It's a law, as we'll see here, that's been established uh, in, uh, in the earth. Can I give you some examples of this? Because if you start, you'll start, if you read the Word of God, you'll just see this throughout the Word. Can I give you some examples just real quick? Give me 30 seconds. I'll prove it to you. Jesus, again, talks about the principle of sowing and reaping uh, in this way. I believe in Matthew 7, in the Sermon on the Mount, He says, ask and you'll what? And you'll receive. That's the principle of sowing and reaping, right? Seek, and you'll what? And you'll find. There you go. Knock, and the door will be opened, right? But the, we love this. This is harvest. This is all good, right? We all love that. But, but sowing giving comes before all this stuff. In other words, if you want to receive uh, an answer to prayer, what do you got to do? You got to ask. If you want a door to open in your life, you got to, you got to knock, right? 
if you want to find some answers, what do you, find some answers in the Word of God, what do you got to do? You got to seek, right? But the promise is this, God cannot be mocked. If we'll sow, we reap. If we invest, it'll, we'll receive a return. If we ask, we'll receive, seek, find, knock, and the door will be open. Another verse I shared this past week uh, on Facebook. I can't remember what the exact verse is, but it says this. It's the law of sowing and reaping. If you forgive, you'll be forgiven. Right? If you forgive, you'll be forgiven. If you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. In other words, like a farmer out here, we got some farmers in the tent, right? Who are sowing, sowing, sowing corn and bean seed right now. Sowing, sowing, sowing. Why? Because they want to reap a harvest. How foolish a farmer would be not to sow in the spring and expect a harvest in the fall. It ain't going to happen. Well, I shouldn't say that. You're going to reap some weeds. <laughs> You're going to reap some cockaburs. You're going to reap some milk, 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 uh, milk plant, milkweed, right? Yeah. Because uh, if you want to determine the harvest, then you've got to what? You have to sow the seed. All right, real quick, there's a passage of Scripture, just to set this in context, that the Apostle Paul teaches us about the principle of sowing and reaping, investments in return, from 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Let's look at this with me up on the screen. If you've got your Bibles, you can open them. We're going to read a pretty large passage of Scripture, but it's packed full of uh, the, the three principles of sowing and the seven benefits of reaping. We're going to look at that here today. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning with verse 6, says this, Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give whatever you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able. Everybody say, God is able. God is able, God is able to bless you abundantly. Woo! Now that ought to make everybody happy right there. God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you'll abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge, there it is, prosperity, the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanksgiving to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ, and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. Now listen to this. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. And the last, last line, last sentence, verse 15. Thanks be to God for His indescribable gift. All right, now, write this down. I don't know if I got this in your notes today, but just real quick in review, the three principles of sowing we covered last week. I'm just going to cover the principles, not the Scriptures, because we talked in great detail last Sunday about that. Number one. The principle of this, sowing, investing, asking, seeking, knocking, is this. Whatever you sow, you'll reap. Whatever you sow, you reap. If we sow a lot, we'll reap a lot. If you don't sow anything, then nothing's coming back. We talked about it last week. If you want a friend, if you want friends, you have to what? You have to be a friend, right? Well, I want love. I want to be loved, right? Wonderful. How many people have you loved this week? I, how many, I, right? I mean, this is the principle of sowing and reaping. Whatever you sow, you'll reap. Number two, here's the good news about sowing. Again, it's free will. You decide what to sow. Whatever it is, we get to decide what we sow. What we sow. Number three, when we sow, we give out of joy, not guilt. Right? So we don't give out of guilt. We give out of joy. It's a joy to give. It's a joy to sow. It's a joy to, to, uh, to be a blessing to others. It just is. Uh, and I tell you what, people that, that live these, these principles out, really you get in on this. It's just wonderful because you see how God can use you, right, to be a blessing to others. And it's a joy. It's a joy to be a blessing. And so we give, we sow, we invest, what, out of joy not guilt. Now, 
We talked in great detail last week again about these three principles of sowing, sowing, sowing. Today, I want to touch on the seven principles of reaping, all right? Now, notice this. How many principles of sowing are there? Three. There's only three. How many principles of reaping? Seven. What does that say? The harvest is always greater than the seed, right? The, the, the reaping is always more than what we sow. For the good or for the bad, right? For the good or for the bad. So we have to be careful what we sow because it's going to come back to us uh, multiple times over. In, in this example, uh, more than 100%, right? Seven times over. Seven times over. All right, number one, look at this with me. Write this down if you're taking notes. The first principle of reaping after you sow. Now, you've got to sow before you reap is this. Number one, write it down. God will bless you to be a blessing. Why does God bring a harvest in your life, in my life, after we sow? To be a blessing. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8. Here it is. Look at it with me. We're going to go deep in the Word today. God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. So there's a promise right there that God's going to supply all your needs, right? Your needs are going to be met. But not just that. God says, I'm going to bless you so that you, your needs not only met, but that you might abound in every good work. In other words, I'm going to bless you to be a blessing. I'm going to bless you so that your needs are met, but I'm going to bless you so that you can meet other people's needs. Are you seeing this? That's called prosperity. If you don't prosper, you can't be a blessing. You might want to be. And there's, I've been there. It's horrible. When God gives, gives an opportunity, you know, there's a, an opportunity that comes across your path in life, and you want to participate, you want to give, you want to be a blessing. And, 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 you know, I don't have anything in my pockets, but, you know, there's nothing in your pocket. It's a blessing to have something in your pocket, right? When an opportunity comes, oh, hey, I can, I can participate in that. I can give. God wants to bless you so that you can be blessed to be a blessing. This is what, uh, again, God said to Abraham in Genesis 12, He said, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you, and you will what? You'll be a blessing. Wow! <laughs> See, we're blessed to be a blessing. We're, we're prosperous to prosper, right? We have an abundance so that we can what? So that we can give to those that those in need, to those that have. Have not, I should say, out of what we have. God will bless you to be a blessing. That's the first principle of reaping, of reaping. But in order to, to receive a blessing and in order to receive uh, prosperity, we've got to what? We've got to sow. All this comes after this. Principle number two, benefit number two, I should say, of the harvest of reaping is this. God will supply you with more seed. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 10 says this, Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your what? Your store of seed. Boy, that's good. That is good. In other words, you don't just receive a harvest, but you receive what? You receive more seed in the harvest. So that you can what? So that you can sow more, and then you can reap more. And then when you reap more, then you can get more seed so you can sow more. It's, it's called the principle of compound interest in the world of finances today. If you know anything about compound interest, it's awesome. It just keeps coming back to you. The more you invest, the more you, and the more you have, the more you can invest. And then you get more, and then the more you can invest, the more. And then, see, this is the, this is the principle of the harvest. Yes, the, har the blessings in the harvest, but in the harvest is what? More seed. In other words, don't eat all your harvest. If you use all your harvest, then you don't have any more seed. You don't have any more to give, right? But if you, if you again, give and you receive, and you, you, then you give some more and you receive. Right? It's the principle of supply. God supplies us with more seed in what? In the future harvest so that we can give again. I like what uh, 
Dr. Mike Murdoch, a pastor in, uh, in, in Fort Worth, Texas, said, said about this, about the principle of the, of the harvest and the seed. He said, what, if what is in your hand isn't large enough to be your harvest, it must be your seed. Right? If a hundred dollars isn't going to cut it and you need a thousand, then sow the hundred and then what? We'll come back as what? It is, is, is the harvest. Is the harvest. So many times we what? We eat the harvest. We, we use it all. Don't use it all. You can use some of it, but don't use it all so that you can continue to sow and reap and sow and reap and sow and reap in life. And again, this isn't just talking only about finances. This is talking about every area of our lives, right? Every area of our lives. In other words, if you want people to be kind to you, what do you got to sow? Sow kindness, right? All right, number three, number three. The third benefit of the harvest is this. God will enlarge your harvest. God will enlarge our harvest. God will enlarge the what? The, the return our, on, on our investment. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 10 says this. Now he who supplies, again, seed to the sower, bread for food, will supply your you know, a store of seed, but also will what? Enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. Um, harvest is what? Harvest is return. Harvest is reaping what we've sown. And notice it says this. Enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. Now, righteousness has to do with right position, uh, right relationship, and right conduct. Right conduct. In other words, again, going back to in order, out of order. When we give first fruits, when we give tithes, when we give offerings, what is that? That's righteousness. We're doing what the Bible tells us to do. It's right action. It's right conduct. And, and it works. It works. When we participate in the principle of sowing and reaping, investments and returns, our harvest, right, our return will increase, will enlarge in our lives. Benefit number four, according to the Word of God, is this. God will make you, oh, this makes, this makes religious people nervous, <laughs> this next word, make you rich in order for you to be what? To be more generous. 2 Corinthians 9, 11. Here it is. You will be made what? Rich in every way so that you can be what? More stingy. Right? So that you can earn all you can, save all you can, and like we learned last week, sit on the can. No, 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 no. Right? What's it say? You will be made rich in every way so that you can be what? Generous on every occasion. Whenever an opportunity comes up. Right? in your life or in life of your loved one or family or whatever, ministry, you, you're blessed, what? To be a blessing. That's what it is. You'll be made rich in order for what? For you to be even more generous. You know, again, let me just use some, some financial numbers to give, to give you an example. Um, let's just say the difference between giving $100 and giving $1,000 towards, towards a particular need. It's, it's great to get, if you've got $100, great, that's great. But how much more it is to give $1,000? See, that, see, that's even being more generous. That's 10 times over what you can get, right? And God says, hey, I'm going to bless you so that you can be more generous than what you were in the past. Why? Because of your harvest. Because you can't give and I can't give what we don't receive, right? Off of what we sow. Be generous on every occasion. And watch this. And through us... Your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. In other words, when we are blessed to be a blessing, when we're made rich in order to be more generous, here's what we do. We say, hey, listen, God's blessed me. God, God's given me, and I just want to be a blessing to you. You know what, that, what happens when we're able to do that and help people out? Here's what happens. Through our generosity, it results in thanksgiving to who? To God. People say, well, praise God. Praise God for Robert. Praise God for Karen. Praise God for Colleen. Praise God for Lana. Oh, God, I just praise you for, for, boy, that generous person. You'll be a blessing. People will praise God for you. <laughs> Amen. And for you being a blessing to them. Hallelujah. This is, this, is what is, this is what is being a part. But if we're poor, if we're in debt, and we don't have it, then we can't what? We can't be generous on all occasions. 
and people won't praise God for our generosity. That leads us to number five. Benefit number five is this. God will supply the needs of God's people through you. Wow. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 12. This service that you perform, the service of what? Sowing and reaping, is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. See, the service that we're performing, when we give, when we give, what does it do? It meets the needs of God's people. See, when you give, again, we've talked about this, but let me just say it again, especially in our context here of being an independent, non-denominational church. When you give to God through the tab, you make ministry possible here at the church. That's just as simple as it is. We are, we are member and friend supported here at the tab. And because of your generosity, we're able what? We're able to meet needs. There isn't a week, let me just tell you right now, uh, there isn't a week my phone doesn't ring from somebody, sometimes inside the church, most time not, most time outside of our church, they were even driving by the, the building or something like that or seeing something on Facebook, they'll give us a call. They'll shoot us an email. Uh, and they'll say, hey, Pastor Tim, you know, um, uh, we, we don't have any food. I've got two kids at home, and we haven't eaten in two days. You don't know nothing about that. You didn't get that phone call. This church got that phone call, right? Now, I got that phone call because we don't have a church secretary right now. <laughs> Are you with me? You purchased the food, right? We, as the church, how do we purchase the food? How do we meet, how do we supply that need for that family who hasn't eaten in a couple days? Through your generosity. How sad it would be to be able to, not be able to say, you know what, I'm really sorry, Mrs. Smith. We're broke. We'd like to give. We'd like to take you to Schnooks, buy you a bunch of groceries. We really would. We would love to do that, but we don't have it. That's sad. That's sad. Are you seeing how this thing works? How sad it is to have an opportunity to help somebody and then be broke and not have it to give. That's why, what? God wants us to be blessed so that we can what? Supply the needs of God's people through you, through us. We're able to do what we're doing because of your generosity, through your, through your giving. That's how, that's how ministry happens here. And here's the good news. We're able to do more and more and more because of your generous giving. You give more, we're able to do more. That's how it works. That's just how it works. And that's how it works in every, every ministry, not just ours. 1 Corinthians 16 uh, 1 through 2, the Apostle Paul goes on to talk to the Corinthian church about this, uh, this, this supplying of God's people through us. It says this, Now about the collection of God's people. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up, and then when I come, no collections will have to be made. In other words, we, we give you an opportunity every week as, as in proportion noticed with your income right? To give to God through the tab. That's what the tithes and offerings times is about. Now, again, as we, as we mentioned before, if you get paid weekly, then give weekly. If you get paid bi-weekly, then give bi-weekly. If you get paid once a month, right? I get, I get paid once a month from one job, I get paid bi-weekly by the other. So that's when I give. That's when we tithe, right? That's when we give offerings. And so as you, according to your income, the, you, you save it, you bring it to God. Now, Please listen. Your gifts, your tithes, your offerings, your first fruits are what? You're giving them to, to the Lord through the tab, right? We're just the means. We're just the means. But you're giving, God, I'm giving this to you. This is, this is, I'm honoring you with my wealth, right? So that what? So that your, your, your people's needs can be met. Benefit number six, as we give to God, God will cause what? People to thank and praise God for our generosity. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 13, Because of the service by which you've proved yourselves, men will praise God for your obedience. Did you see that? Obedience. That accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. 
See, when we're obedient to give first fruits, tithes, and offerings, you know what happens? Here's what happens. That it is, Paul said in 2 Corinthians here, a confession of the gospel. Let me say it this way. It's testifying to the gospel. It's testifying of our faith. I mean, it really is. And we're, we're going to hear testimonies here in, you know, in the next couple of weeks. But every time we give, what are we doing? We're testifying Jesus is Lord. We're testifying, God, I'm honoring you with my finances, right? Every time you pray, you know what you're doing? You're testifying. Every time, let me say this. Every time you come to church, what are you doing? To your neighbors. To people that drive by here and see your car parked in our parking lot. What is that? That's a testimony. I caught them. They're at church. Right? We're testifying that we love the Lord by being here today. Now, does that mean if you're not here today, you don't love the Lord? I'm not saying that. But when your car's in your, tr in your driveway or in your garage on a Sunday morning and not at church, you're testifying what? That you're not at church. Right? In other words, if you were brought up on the court of law, and, 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 where were you, you know, on, uh, what is it today? May, May the 20-something? 20 26. May 26. Where were you? Well, I was, at, I was at the tab. Well, prove it. Well, I, I, so, so many people saw me in my car. What? In the parking lot. That's a testimony. Right? That's a testimony. Our giving is a testimony of our love for the Lord, our love for the things of God. Are you seeing how this thing works? And our testimony causes people what? To thank and praise God for our generosity. Can I be honest with you about something? This might rub some people wrong, and I don't mean to offend. I'm a nice guy. I really am. I'm a nice guy, but I'm just kind of being ugly, you know, sometimes. I've never been blessed by a poor person. I've never been hired by a poor person. No poor person has ever given me a job. Are you seeing this thing? I've what? I thank and praise God. I've received lots of blessings. I've never received a blessing from a poor person. It's been someone who's what? Been generous to God or to me. And I thank God for them. Now, there might be some poor people that wanted to bless me and couldn't give it. I'm not saying their, their hearts were wrong. They just didn't have it. But you think about this. When people give to you, we're talking about people receiving in this verse. When poor people, when people in need receive, they praise God for your generosity, right? Not for your intent, right? When we're able to, and we were, we were able by, let me go back to, you know, I'm not using her real name, Mrs. Smith and the two kids. We did buy the groceries. And she was, oh, I praise God for you, and I praise God for the tab. Right? That's good. Oh, that gives me goosebumps, right? Are you with me? Yeah. Hallelujah. And, that's, and we're just saying, well, praise God. He's blessed me. Hallelujah. And I'm blessed to be a blessing. The principle and the law of what? Sowing and reaping. Hallelujah. It's good. It's good. Not only will your generosity, my generosity, cause people to give God thanks and praise for you, and for your generosity, benefit number seven. Look at this with me as we wrap up here today. God will cause people to pray for you. Woo! Now, it's good when people thank God for you, right? That's good. Hallelujah. I think that pleases the ears of the Father. But there's something better than people giving praise for you, and that is when people pray for you. When people say, hey, oh, God, I just thank you for, for Ruby. Thank you for her generosity. And then they say, now God, God, bless Ruby. Prosper Ruby. Take care of Ruby's needs. See, our generosity causes people to pray for us. They become intercessors. <laughs> right? In other words, they're saying this. In their prayers, these are people that have been blessed by you. In their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of what? Because of the surpassing grace God has given to you. What is that grace? Prosperity. Blessing. People will pray that God will continue to bless Robert. Oh, God, thank you for the blessing of Robert. Oh, he's such a blessing. Now, God, continue to bless Robert. Continue to prosper Robert. That's good stuff right there. And God says, you know what? I will. I will. Why? Because he's found a vessel 
through which, watch this now, through which he can get what? His blessing through. See, I think so many times we're just focused on getting the blessing. Please listen. This is good. Oh, this is really good. We're so focused on getting the blessing to us where God's focused on getting the blessing to us and through us. Do you see that? That's, where, that's, that's what we want. Yes, we want the blessing to come to us. Amen. But we want the blessing to come not just to us and stop, but we want the blessing to come to us and what? Through us. Through us. So it invokes praise and worship of God to God and causes what? Causes the testimony of Christ to advance and for ultimately people to what? To intercede for us. Look at this with me. Philippians 1, 3 through 4 talks about this, this, this seventh benefit. It says this, speaking of the Apostle Paul to the Philippian church, I thank my God every time I remember you. Wow, look at that. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from this day until now. Did you see that? See, here's the thing. If you, if you read the context, the Philippian church gave to bless the Apostle Paul. He, at this time, he was in need. He needed to, sometimes you, sometimes you need to receive, right? You need to be blessed. He says, you know what? I, every time I think about you Philippians, I thank God and I, I pray for you. And, and I, I get joy, I get filled with joy because of you. Because of what? Because of how you gave. Because of your partnership in the gospel. See, God will cause people to give thanks for you and God will cause people to pray for you when we give, when we give. Now notice the Apostle Paul's response to this principle of sowing and reaping the investments and returns. He calls it the indescribable gift. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 15 says this, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift, right? What is that indescribable gift? Uh, the, the gift the opportunity to give and receive, to sow and reap, to be a blessing. It's an indescribable, not watch this now, not duty, not requirement. You're required. No, it's just, it's just a gift. It's just a, you, again, this is, we're talking about free will offerings here. Free, what an indescribable gift to go out what? And sow and to bless people in life. Jesus said it this way in Acts 20, verse 35. He said, it's more blessed to give than what? Than to receive. Because when you give, you'll receive, and you can give more, and you can receive more, and, 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 and God will increase you, and increase you, and increase you to where we can what? We can be a greater blessing to more people for Jesus Christ. Amen? Now let me just close with this. It would be great, and it is great, to reach one soul for Jesus. Amen? I mean, it's, God bankrupted heaven over one soul. If you were the only person that believed in Him, He still would have sent Jesus Christ into the earth. All right, are you with me this? Thank God for, if, if this church only reaches one soul, and it's reached more than that, but let's just say, all right, if, if all we did was get one person saved over the life of this ministry, it's worth it. It's worth every, 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 every praise band practice. It's worth every tithe check. It's worth it all, right? If we reach one child over here in the kids' ministry, it's worth it, okay? How much more if we reach 100 or 1,000 or 10,000? Are, are, are you seeing this? How much more? And that's what, when we give, we can reach more people. When we, when we serve, we can, we can help more people, right? That's what's saying. It's, it's boy, what a, as we give, it expands. It, 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 it grows. It grows. And it's the indescribable gift. It's the opportunity that God gives us to participate with him in a law and a principle that he's established from the very beginning. Today, I want to conclude by, uh, by, 
calling Kevin Brown up here. Kevin's going to come at this time and share a testimony of, of this principle of how him and Karen uh, uh, participated in this indescribable gift. So, uh, so Kevin, come up here. Let me, uh, let me see if we can get, here we go. Just, uh, I'll tell you what, just come on over here. There we go. All right, there we go. So we get it on, on, uh, on, yeah. on, on, on the tape here. Am I, uh, am I on there TV? You yeah, you're on. You're on. So anyway, no. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us well, what thank happened you. in your life. Tell us what happened. Okay, thank you, Pastor Tim. Uh, well, I'll just uh, tell a story. My wife and I were in the Navy, and uh, we both got out, and uh, we moved to Bloomington. And uh, my sister had gotten a house for us, and uh, I was working on the house, fixing it up. Uh, and we were living there rent free, but we had some money saved up and we were going through it, you know, for groceries. We had a newborn uh, baby girl, Sarah, and uh, one, uh, it was uh, New Year's Eve and uh, I was in the kitchen and uh, I was putting a new countertop on and uh, the doors under the sink were open and I, and I was hitting on it and, you know, trying to peel it off, and some dirt fell out from behind the sink. Well, it was one of these old sinks. It had the faucets come out here, you know. And so I thought, well, this is a mess. And I reached up there to wipe the dirt off or whatever it was up there. And I reached as far as my arm would go, and there was like a two-by-four underneath the window. And I felt something up there, and... Uh, Oh, I gotta go back. Yeah, you gotta go back. Go back. So <laughs> we took a break. Yeah. And uh, uh, I asked my wife if she'd sent uh, uh, um, uh, an offering to the 700 Club. No. We hadn't started going to church yet. And she said, no, she hadn't sent that check because we were running so low on money. And I said, well, you know, and I told her the story about Elijah and how he had uh, had the widow and her son. Um, they just had a handful of meal and a little bit of oil to make a cake. And he said, you make that cake and you give it to me. Okay, so she did it. And, and during the famine, their cruise of oil and their barrel of meal never ran out. Amen. And I said, that's the principle. When you don't have it, okay, you give it like, and God's going to bless us. So anyway, back to the reaching up <laughs> to the two before. And I found some, there was something up there. And I thought it was like some uh, wallpaper, you know, because people, uh, you know, just leave trash in the wall and put a wall up. And I grabbed it and I pulled it down. And it had a, a rubber band on it, and it was so dried out it just popped and, and unfolded $5,000 in my hand. Wow. And, <laughs> and this was right after, right after I, uh, we had uh, had this break. And so uh, I tithed off that. Okay, and uh, just a few weeks later, uh, my wife got a job at State Farm. And they weren't even hiring, wow. but they said, you know what? They said, uh, because you have your resume, we're going to hire you. And not too long after that, I got a job at the post office as a letter carrier. And uh, since that time, and I always tell this in this story like this, we have not wanted to do something or wanted something that we couldn't have or couldn't do because God has blessed us. And, and I, this isn't a pat on the back for me, but when, when we do our taxes, 10% of our, of our income goes to, to tithe into the church. And God has blessed us. And uh, amen. that's it. Amen. 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 That's amen. The story. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Kevin. Amen. That's just a testimony. Again, they sowed into the work of God, and man, they reaped within, was it the same day? I mean, you sow and reap, I mean, that type of thing. And, and that can happen. Uh, but either way, here, it's just a law. It's a principle. It's the indescribable gift. When, we, when we're blessed, here's the thing I love about that story is God can get it to you even in the wall. <laughs> right? God can bring back the harvest. And you just leave it up to him. I don't know how he does it. I, he might, again, he might have money in the wall for you. Uh, he might tell <laughs> someone. Right, he, I bet he <laughs> tore all the walls out, right? Yeah. <laughs> but here, here's the thing. When we give to God, here's the point. When we give to God, 
God what? God, God returns it back to us. This is the principle of sowing and reaping. And, and he's very, very, um, how shall I say, uh, surprising in how he gets it back. I, I mean, we all have testimonies, if you've been a part of this, just how, how it happens. And you, and you just go, wow, that was God. I would have never imagined he would have used this person or that job or, right, how he, how he gets it to you. You just, you just give and bless people, and, and God, God will bring it back to you. And uh, so thank you, Kevin and Karen, for, for sharing, that, sharing that testimony today. Well, are you blessed? You receive it today? You're blessed to be a blessing, and uh, we thank God for that. Let's pray today uh, with, uh, with one another as we close. Heavenly Father, thank you for the indescribable gift of sowing and reaping, of giving to people in need to just just being a blessing and somehow some way the blessing comes back even more into our lives so that we can be a further blessing lord help us not to just be blessed uh, to receive but blessed to give and thank you for uh, for for the indescribable gift and we pray this in jesus name amen and amen hi I'm Timothy James Farrell, and I serve as the lead pastor at The Tab. And I'm Mindy Farrell. The Tab is now located at 1845 West Hovey Avenue in Normal, Illinois. Here's some things you can expect to experience at The Tab.